All right, we're back again uh, talking about the divine artist uh, who has been able to uh, take a pilgrimage, a journey to meet the 250 glass bead game members. Uh, so he's been able to travel through time and meet all of these uh, uh, most important people in the history of the world and uh, talk about their lives and and uh, he's been able to um, uh, take pieces of their thoughts and their lives and apply them to himself uh, to become the divine artist so little pieces of all of uh, the great ideas that they had uh, really make up what the divine artist is all about. So we're on to number 41, uh, the 41st most important person of uh, the glass bead game. And uh, that person is Anaxagoras. Again, this probably is somebody that's not uh, very well known uh, throughout history or not known by many people. And uh, really, I don't know a lot about his life either. Um, he lived, I think, somewhere between like maybe 300 or 500 BC. And uh, uh, the most important thing that he did was come up with a, um, and made the statement, everything is in everything. And this is almost like a holistic of view, uh, view um, and along the lines of like a Jacob Bernoulli who stated that uh, a, a finite set contains an infinite amount of members. Also M.C. Escher, uh, a lot of his artwork tried to depict a, a finite infinite, a finite uh, image with an infinite amount of images within it. Well, um, Anaxagoras with his everything is in everything uh, is really an amazing statement when you dig into mathematics and um, uh, the holistic nature of the universe. Uh, if you think of kind of like um, uh, each cell in the body has the DNA mapping of everything else uh, within it and possibly that the entire universe is in a way um, kind of this paradox of everything being within itself uh, within the small pieces the big pieces everything uh, everything is in everything uh, so he's number 41 uh, number 42 uh, this is another guy that keeps moving up uh, the ranks of the glass bead game um, Dante Alighieri uh, lived around 12 or 1300 AD wrote the Divine Comedy which was a collaboration of three books um, uh, Purgatory um, Heaven and Hell and I can't remember the exact names of all of the journeys that Virgil was able to take Dante on and he met a lot of people in his pilgrimage in the Divine Comedy and uh, I haven't read these, uh, but I know about them, and uh, I keep meaning to, and especially I have uh, the Purgatory upstairs, my son has, and he loved that book, and I, I keep meaning to read it, but there's always this limit of time uh, to get through all of these things. Um, but uh, Dante, again, he was a guy I believe was exiled uh, during his lifetime, somewhat shunned, uh, possibly didn't follow the dogma of the time, and, uh, and wrote these, um, the Divine Comedy, which is almost like this, this journey between good and evil, and why does evil exist, and where is this perfect state of heaven and reality. Uh, that potentially can exist and uh, almost the absurdity of why the absurdity of existence of why is there anything at all and why is there evil and so forth number 43 is Bertrand Russell and uh, his book that he wrote our knowledge of uh, the external world was one of my favorite books and was one that was used for the um, 
writing of my first book, The Metaphysics of Being, talked a lot about this discreteness and continuity and um, um, the fact that uh, we view reality in a discrete way. All of our concepts and thoughts and particles and space and time are all discrete units. And um, then this paradox of what what could be continuous in almost like the ideal uh, sense of a mathematical sense of of continuity and um, and even in mathematics um, you can never get at true continuity there's always these fractions flowing into an infinite regress and calculus uh, never actually reaches a point it's always approaching a limit and uh, so this uh, Bertrand Russell um, uh, tried to put this all together and and apply it to reality as well uh, so that book uh, was really great he also collaborated with Alfred North Whitehead and tried to uh, create the Bible of mathematics principle of mathematica which was ultimately um, uh, an attempt to uh, prove all of mathematics and its truth and its theorems and axioms and it was ultimately uh, shot down uh, by Kurt Gödel with his incompleteness theorem that at the b very foundation of it uh, the ultimate truth of it could not be proven from within its uh, within a closed system number 44 Erwin Schrodinger um, is really known for his idea of well Schrodinger cats Schrodinger's cats and the double slit experiment how two particles can exist in a dual state of reality at the same time and uh, in a state of potential and ultimately one of those are observed and uh, become the real reality so this idea of superposition is really a fascinating to think about that ultimately if we apply this to our our state of being and our existence that we have this real existence that we experience and perceive and live but there's also an infinite uh, state of potential to it that's unobserved and this leads to the theory of almost like a many world uh, state of being where these other potential states of being can also exist outside of our perceived reality and they have their own reality in the paths that uh, that they choose either in a random or um, a random or chosen uh, method and you kind of get into this idea and paradox and arguments about freedom and determinism and in many worlds or one world and and the world that we perceive so this whole idea of superposition and um, what it would mean to have potential and uh, unfulfilled potential uh, unperceived potential and what that really all means does that almost have an existence to itself as well uh, number 45 is Raphael a painter that lived around 1500 AD around uh, the same time as Michelangelo and I was able to see one of his works which is absolutely fantastic called the School of Athens and it's about 18 feet by 18 feet and it takes up an entire wall within the Vatican and uh, it's apps it was amazing I didn't know what it was prior to then but I've learned about it now and uh, he was able to <coughs> in this giant painting <coughs> put together almost like a glass bead game of all these people that are contemplating reality and existence and mathematics and the mysteries of the universe at the center of it are Plato pointing to the heavens and Aristotle pointing to the ground uh, so you have the idealism versus the realism argument between those two and then you had also many other characters of Michelangelo and uh, Heraclitus and um, I have an actual um, 
poster of the painting hanging on the wall over here that my son gave me and uh, that he was able to um, paint all of these characters throughout history these philosophical and mathematical Euclid's in it and um, I can't think of the other people right now but there's about 50 people in this painting and it's absolutely amazing and my favorite uh, piece probably even greater than um, or equivalent to the Sistine Chapel um, that painting uh, on the ceiling uh, number 46 of the most important uh, glass bead game members and people that the divine artist have met through this pilgrimage, uh, this journey through time, is uh, Mozart. And again, I, I listen to classical music often in my Mercedes <laughs> on Sirius Radio. Um, and uh, I appreciate it and I make a point of listening to it. I don't know a lot about Mozart's life necessarily, but just this idea of um, <laughs> the symphony of the universe <coughs> and the beauty of it uh, has him at 46. Number seven, John Keats, is a um, poet and uh, he's very high on the glass bead game list because of one um, statement he made at the end of his poem, Ode to a Grecian Urn. Ode to a Grecian Urn is about an urn and uh, uh, and about someone's life, the, the memory of someone's life and, uh, and the eternal nature <coughs> to that person after they die and what the mystery of what that is all about and at the very end of this poem is the term uh, sentence beauty is truth truth beauty and it's something I actually have tattooed on my arm and uh, just as one of my favorites uh, when you get into what is the absolute truth and nature to existence and being in the universe um, yeah, if you go by this beauty is truth truth beauty it is uh, beautiful in itself almost. It almost transcends itself in its uh, indescribable nature. Number 48 is George Hegel and he wrote uh, the Phenomeni Phenomenology of Spirit. He was friends with Holderlin and Fichte around this very important time where German idealism was coming together where you had Holderlin and Fichte and Heidegger and Hegel and they were studied together and knew each other all at this very important time around the 1790s uh, when Critique of Pure Reason was written and Phenomenology of Spirit and this uh, shift of uh, metaphysical thinking about uh, uh, the divine eye and the eternal nature of the spirit and of reality and uh, all of that being very important in the history of physics and philosophy. Number 49 is M.C. Escher. Um, a lot of his paintings are um, like optical illusions <coughs> where stairs are going one way and they're feeding into another way and uh, also um, he does a lot with uh, finite images containing potentially an infinite amount of images. It's called an, M, uh, an Escher tiling, which is kind of like our glass bead game uh, emblem. <coughs> and uh, so it, his artwork isn't that beautiful to look at, but just the philosophical nature of it does put him at number 49 on the glass bead game list. Uh, number 40, 50 is Soren Kierkegaard, who is almost the father and maybe the father of what's called existentialism. And many of the existentialists, such as Kierkegaard, Heidegger, um, Nietzsche, uh, which really get into ontology and the study of the self and the being and being. And Soren Kierkegaard uh, was had 
was very uh, optimistic and um, and uh, his study of the self, the divine self, um, is what a lot of his uh, uh, books are about and trying to tie this to the nature of God and so forth. Uh, number 51, Empedocles, a guy that probably a lot of people don't know, very high on the list here. Um, Holderlin wrote a book about him, Frederick Holderlin, the poet, wrote a book about him uh, called the... Um, uh, I can't remember, The Tragedy of Empedocles or something that he wrote a book about Empedocles' life. Uh, Empedocles was um, lived around 500 BC in Sicily and um, uh, thought he was almost like a godlike uh, character and uh, believed that the soul was immortal. <coughs> well, people just thought he was nuts, I believe. And at one point, at the end of his life, to prove that he had this immortal nature to him, uh, jumped in Mount Etna, a live volcano, uh, to prove his immortality, and he's never been seen since. Uh, so, if you're ever in Sicily, you can go see uh, Mount Etna, where Empedocles eternally lives. Uh, number 52 is another guy, uh, is just a mystique about his, uh, his nature, uh, puts me, puts him very high on the list. Fyodor Dostoevsky was a Russian novelist and uh, wrote the Brothers Karmanov and wrote, uh, there was a part in one of his books, almost like this, uh, uh, The Nature of Evil, of why does evil exist and uh, why would an all-loving God create evil and suffering and uh, it's really kind of a fascinating thing. In, in his personal life, he tried to um, live altruistically and even marry uh, on an altruistic basis to make his wife happy. And he was actually suffered and was unhappy his entire life. Uh, number 53, Johann Sebastian Bach. Again, uh, somebody that I hear almost on a daily basis on the symphony channel or the pop symphony channel uh, the two channels I get on Sirius radio and um, I again I don't know a lot about his life other than he was German and at one point one of his symphonies or songs was made the anthem of Germany <laughs> so he was just uh, uh, just a monumental figure <coughs> number 54 Aristotle was the uh, was mentored by Plato, broke away from Plato and uh, the academy and started the Lyceum, which was kind of an a offshoot of the academy and an extension of it, but um, tried to bridge the gap between realism and idealism. And uh, ultimately, uh, was the foundation really of realism and modern science and um, uh, Ayn Rand uh, talks about Aristotle being the greatest philosopher of all time and that uh, he is the only philosopher uh, worthy of uh, study. <laughs> um, Aristotle interesting enough was also the mentor for Alexander the Great who conquered the world at that time. Uh, 55 is uh, Stephen Hawking who uh, was uh, uh, disabled uh, with a disease uh, to, to a wheelchair is considered one of the most fascinating uh, scientists and quantum physicists in the world today. Uh, did get to take a trip into space recently. NASA allowed him to go into space uh, on one of the trips and uh, a lot of uh, what he talks about is uh, black holes. Uh, he wrote a book uh, called um, A Brief History of Time and uh, uh, in black holes that uh, space and time don't exist and that they have this uh, laws uh, that are counterintuitive to uh, they break down 
the laws of our reality in which we live in space and time. Um, the laws break down in um, inside a black hole in in that uh, time, space and time don't even exist, I believe. Um, in his book, he uh, uh, had something written in there, uh, and I can't remember exactly, but it led to what came, became the Magna Paradox, in which you have two intersecting lines, and at what point, if you tried to separate two intersecting lines, do they disengage and become parallel? And it's at this point where um, infinity merges with nothing is the point uh, where intersecting lines disengage to become parallel. And uh, this uh, idea that I call the Magna Paradox uh, really sprang from something he was talking about in that book, A Brief History of Time. And um, it's really amazing, something that uh, uh, is logically impossible that uh, or intersecting lines could ever disengage because they go out to infinity as they're disengaging um, actually happen on a routine, fa routine fashion because we just go like this and now they're parallel. So that is an absolute paradox, which I call Magna Paradox, and it's been included in um, several of the five books uh, that I've written. Um, number 56 is David Bohm. He wrote a book called Wholeness and the Implicate Order, which I have up here on the shelf. I have books all over the place here. Um, and what this is about is that this implicate order is um, almost like that there's an internal state of consciousness and being and communication built into reality in the entirety of the universe that's in constant communication with itself. Almost like the universe is alive. <laughs> so um, that's really uh, amazing and kind of expands on this idea of what Roger Penrose came up with in uh, The Emperor's New Mind and uh, Stuart Hameroff with his idea of uh, almost like the quantum soul and the quantum mind and this uh, theory of entanglement where that the universe is in constant instantaneous uh, communication within itself. Julian Barber is number 57 wrote a book called The End of Time and uh, it's just an amazing book and it really is supported by uh, science and quantum mechanics uh, again about these uh, uh, eternal stagnant s snapshots and there's, there's an infinite amount of these uh, eternal snapshots of reality that exist and that we experience them in a sequence um, and that is what reality is. This kind of goes along the line of Zeno's arrow paradox where um, how does a moving arrow at any one point in time the one fundamental unit of that is a stationary unit. Um, so this kind of goes back to the cinematic view again of the universe of how we put together a film is by still shots and then you uh, move them very quickly and that creates the illusion of motion and that's how we view a film and he wrote a book about this is that how it, that that's how we're viewing all of reality on uh, number 58 is Alyssa Toffoli she is an Italian singer that sings half of her songs in Italian and half in English and uh, she is the highest uh, pop artist on the entire list of current living musicians um, and the reason her voice is absolutely beautiful if you ever get a chance Alyssa Toffoli uh, her music is absolutely phenomenal and specifically um, 
she's had one song and a line out of one of the songs that there's a video of a uh, musical video uh, called Forgiveness is the Key to the World and it's probably my favorite song of all time. Number 59 is Martin Heidegger who wrote Being and Time contrary to the book that I wrote Being in Time. Uh, Being and Time is one of the most important ontological books uh, in the history of the world and um, he talks a lot about being and time that our being is within time within space and time that our experience our Dasein is uh, the spirit experience within space and time and that is this realism this reality um, that we know and experience he's very hard to read for me for some reason I don't know if it's just because of German translation to English or what but it's very hard to read uh, Martin Heidegger's work oddly enough at the end of his life he wrote a thousand pages on the poet Frederick Holderlin which not many people know uh, also Heidegger studied under Edmund Herschel Hustle and uh, uh, in 1925 is when he wrote Being and Time. Number 6D is John McTaggart and this is this group of uh, I believe they were English uh, and maybe even F.H. Bradley was English as well as um, of almost these idealists um, that uh, he kind of went along the lines of Zeno but in a logical way uh, his, his work called The Unreality of Time proved that time couldn't exist uh, due to these logical paradoxes and I've read it a couple of times it's very difficult to understand but his whole idea of um, uh, the unreality of time and also he wrote a piece or book called The Nature of Existence which is very good and I forget who said it uh, but he wrote in the early 1900s and they said that when they see John McTaggart <coughs> they view him as an actual platonic form so I thought that was pretty interesting uh, number six, 61 is Frederick Schelling I don't know a lot about him other than again he's into this mode of German idealism and uh, that uh, reality is uh, within the mind <coughs> and is uh, almost this uh, idea that all of reality exists within the mind and I keep meaning to check more into uh, uh, Frederick Schelling and uh, again just limits of time uh, I will get there um, number 62 Salvador Dali uh, at Marquette University uh, there's a picture of myself with uh, the Madonna of Port Ladat which is uh, one of two paintings that he did uh, called the Madonna of Port Lagat where Mary, Mother Mary has Jesus in a surrealistic uh, image um, and he did this around 1949 the Catholic Church asked him to do it again and he made another Madonna of Port Lagat a little bit different and a little less surrealistic uh, and that version I believe is somewhere in France right now also when I was in um, Rome I was able to see a lot of uh, Dali's work uh, at the Vatican there were a couple of pieces of work uh, by uh, Dali Salvador Dali there um, he got into surrealism and also my sister mentioned to me yesterday that she has been to two of Dali's museums one in Florida and another somewhere else where a collection of many of Dali's works are in the United States uh, 63 is Frederick Schiller a poet wrote Ode to Joy again I don't know a lot about him uh, but Beethoven ultimately incorporated one of his poems into his symphonies Ode to Joy uh, it's kind of a famous uh, lyrical tune now uh, I did learn on the guitar at one point um, um, 
and a lot of people refer to Frederick Schiller uh, similar to Frederick Holderlin, these poets that have hit, had a lot of uh, philosophical and impact on people, musicians, and composers uh, throughout time, throughout history. Uh, number 64, David Hilbert, very important in the early 1900s and 1920s, um, was coming up with this theory of everything. Uh, and Einstein came up with the theory of relativity, and Einstein, that was the theory that everyone took to. Uh, but they were, Einstein and David Hilbert were in this race, really, uh, to come up with this ultimate theory, and uh, Einstein did it and, and came up with that. But David Hilbert is really an uh, interesting guy, especially like in the 1920s, came up with ideas like um, Hilbert space, uh, like almost these manifolds of uh, many worlds theory, and also came up with the Hilbert Hotel, in which an infinite amount of people can ultimately fill, uh, uh, stay at a hotel that's full, uh, but also there's an infinite number of uh, hotel rooms still available in a hotel room that's full. And I went through this in detail in the last book, The Journey to Qualia. It's just one of these other paradoxes uh, of the universe uh, that um, kind of leads to this theory that there's no ultimate truth or way we could ever understand uh, the in infinite nature of the universe. So I'm just going to stop there for now. This was video three of the divine artist who was able to travel through time and meet all the top members of the Glass Bead Game.